This is Jackie Tantillo, and I host Should Have Listened to My Mother. This week's episode is called Strength of Her Daughters, and my guest is Kim Miller. Unfortunately, Kim's older sister, Gloria, who she idolized and adored and talks about quite a bit in this podcast, uh, passed away one week prior to this episode airing. Gloria was very influential in Kim's life, as was her mother, but her sister showed her the ropes and gave her the confidence to be who she is today. So, in honor of Gloria, my heart is saddened for Kim and her family, but I hope she's listening wherever she is. Hello, this is Jackie Tantillo with another edition of Should Have Listened to My Mother. Today's guest found her personal voices at a very young age. It was 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated. The Vietnam War was ongoing. Vice President Nixon was running against incumbent President Hubert Humphrey in the upcoming election, and my guest joined her mother to stuff and lick envelopes in support of Humphrey. Humphrey was defeated, and years later, our troops came home. Unfortunately, at my guest's home, things were not too good. She made it her job to become the protector of her two sisters against nasty advances from her mother's second husband. Today, she is still active and supportive for things she believes in and feels that when you are passionate about something, you have to say something. She supports women's rights, gay rights, ACT UP, gays against guns, and more. Kim Miller, it's a pleasure to have you. Welcome to Should Have Listened to My Mother on the OG Podcast Network. It's a pleasure to be here. For the next couple of minutes, Kim, I'd love to talk to you about the relationship that you had with your mom. Is she at the forefront of your mind? Is she a constant for you in your life? The career choices that you made, personal choices that you made? We can help one another so much by sharing these stories and talking about how much we learned. So are you who you are today because of your mom or or in spite of your mom? Um, I am most definitely an activist. I have been almost all my life because of my mom. She was very active against injustice all over. And um, despite the fact that we didn't have the best home situation, she made it her business to get out there and do whatever she could while she was working and also raising her three daughters and a stepdaughter, she took whatever time she could to do whatever she could to make the world a better place. And one of my fondest memories is in 1968, the summer of 1968, when Richard Nixon was running for president against Hubert Humphrey. We lived in Nassau County, Long Island, which I'm not sure if it still is, Uh, It probably still is, but back then it was seriously a Republican stronghold. Um, And there was a Democrat, a man named Eugene Nickerson, who was running for the county executive. And my mom really wanted him to win. My mom and we had another Democratic family, two, two, two doors down, two houses down. We were the only Democrats on the block and probably in the entire neighborhood. And my mom took me to Eugene Nickerson's campaign office on Hempstead Turnpike, and we sat down together and stuffed envelopes for not only Eugene Nickerson, but also for Hubert Humphrey. And we folded them all together, and then she put them in the envelopes and sealed the envelopes. And back then, you had to lick the stamp. 1968, remember, so that was my job. (laughs) So that was my job. All right, she closed the envelopes, and I put the stamps on. You were 10 years old? Something like that. I would turn 10 in September. This was probably August of 1968, and, yes, a month later I turned 10. Uh, So I guess I was going into fifth grade. It was the summer between fourth and fifth grade, and she got me started. She showed me that when you want something to happen, you have to make it happen. You can't just sit home and hope that it happens or wish for it to happen. You have to go out and do what you can do to make what you want 
happened. What is your mom's name? My mom's name was Anne. She was an Italian-American from Brooklyn, one of ten children, and the only one to marry a non-Italian. She married a beautiful, handsome, smart Navy officer shortly after World War II. He was from Oregon, and they met because the ship he was on got stuck on a sandbar in Manhattan, <laughs> in, the Hud- in, in the Hudson River, and they couldn't <laughs> leave. So, so his friend on the ship said, come on, I'm taking you out on a double date. Um, my girlfriend, who, lived, who was my mom's friend in Brooklyn and worked with her at Bergdorf Goodman, um, my girlfriend will find a date for you, and we're going out in New York. And they met on a, on a blind date, and it was love at first sight, and they got married. I think maybe six or seven months later. Um, but the first thing my grandmother, her mother, said when she met my dad was, is he Catholic? So my dad converted to Catholicism to marry my mom. They had, unfortunately, only 13 years of their beautiful romance together because he was uh, killed in 1960 in an, uh, in, um, a helicopter crash while trying to land the pilot was trying to land on the aircraft carrier my dad was the executive officer of the aircraft carrier and they were anchored off of puerto rico and it was a crash and my dad and one young marine died i was 16 months old so my mom was a single mom for a while and then she married a horrible man and we all stuck together and tried to survive the nine years that she was married this horrible person because I was such a tomboy. Even though I was the youngest, I became the protector once my older sister went off to college. But my older sisters also learned from my mom about activism and doing what needs to be done to make the world a better place. What year did your dad die? 1960, February 8th of 1960. What was it like? Obviously, you were too young to know personally, I, I, but... I don't I don't really remember we were living in Virginia and the chaplain came to the door my aunt and uncle and cousins were visiting with us from Brooklyn and I believe I was taking a nap when the chaplain came to the door and I woke up because of the mayhem that ensued and so I I have emotional memories of that moment of being 16 months old and kind of realizing on an emotional level that my life as I knew it was over and uh, that something was terribly, terribly wrong. How did your mom deal with all of this? She's from the large family, so I'm assuming everything changed drastically. Did she get a job? Did she still do her activism work? Did she focus on the girls? I'm assuming she remarried because she knew the significance of having a male figure at the time was very right. important and for support. Right. So uh, after my, my dad was buried at Arlington National Cemetery, we she sold the house in Virginia, and we moved to Brooklyn with relatives for a while. And then her parents, my grandparents, helped her buy a house on Long Island. And my mom was incredibly strong. She did She did get a job, um, and she did whatever she had to do. My grandfather, after my grandmother died, my grandfather came and lived with us for a while. And that helped her out, too, because she could work and he could pick us up after school. Um, and my sister, my oldest sister, is nine years older than I am, so she also helped my mom a ton and learned from my mom and then taught us a lot. My my older sister Gloria taught us so much and helped out around the house. I I still look up to her. She was also a tomboy and she is my idol to this day. That's pretty cool. That's yeah. pretty cool. Now why do you think I'm imagining that your mom and didn't really know this 
all the sides of this second husband of hers before she got married. I imagine she was thinking she was doing the best for her children. Yes, because it was 1964, and it's very difficult to be a single mom with three young daughters um, in in that environment. You know, women were supposed to be married back then, and I didn't feel like women needed to be married. I I feel like <laughs> I am a lesbian, and I feel like I have been a feminist all my life. I used to scandalize these older women that my mom would play bridge with by telling them when I, I remember specifically when I was four years old, telling them I'm never getting married and I'm never having babies. And so I obviously didn't necessarily know that I was gay. I was four years old, but I did know that I wasn't going that route that everybody else seemed to be following. Um, and my mom was fine with that all my life. She, indulged my tomboy side and um she encouraged me to be myself but for her being in her mid-30s in 1964 with three young daughters it just it was very hard to be a single mom at that point and so she was introduced to this man who we thought was great i wanted a dad you know, I never really knew my dad. I wanted someone that I could call daddy. At that point, I was five years old when they met. And I was kind of thrilled because he seemed nice. But once they got married and we all moved in together, it became apparent that he was not a very nice person. He was very abusive, very physically and psychologically abusive. And they were married until I was 15. So nine years of my life of living with this crazy man who would tell us horrible things about ourselves, would tell us that emotions weren't necessary, would not forbid my mother from hugging us, and so she would sneak hugs and kisses when she came in to say goodnight. I, I mean, I come from this giant Brooklyn Italian family. Of course we hug and kiss all the time. And I... <laughs> and I of course you do. <laughs> I, and I, I, I used him. I was smart enough to use him as an example of how not to be a human being. So I tried not to imitate him, and I have three children of my own, and I hug and kiss them all the time and tell them I love them, and I'm I'm pretty much there for them when they need me. B is 20, the twins are 16, and they're still, you would think, teenagers, ah, you know, they don't come in for hugs very often. My kids come in for hugs at least five times a day each. They will tell me, Mom, I need a hug, and sometimes we have group hugs, and if we can capture the cat, we include the cat in the group hugs. <laughs> and why shouldn't you? Now, did your mom's family know what was going on behind your closed doors with this guy, your the second husband, as you refer to him? Well, he was a, he was abusive. He would hit us. He pushed me down the stairs. Uh, I at, so at one point, once my older sister left, I had to become the protector of my mom my middle sister, my stepsister, and myself. And, I mean, we there were fisticuffs. There was a lot of shouting. The cops came quite often. He he um, he got a BB gun, a rifle, and he actually shot his own daughter, my stepsister, in the ankle across, from across the yard. And I still think to this day, if, if I had just called the cops right then, he would have gone to jail, and maybe it would have all been over. But it it, it went on. We, you know, everybody forgave him. He said, "I'm sorry," um, but I mean, he did despicable things. He was just awful, and he used to tell me that I was a zero, that I would never amount to anything, and so I was pretty determined to prove him wrong. But where he, did you come left. from? <laughs> where did you get that that belief in yourself and? No one's going to push me around because a lot of kids that age, this could have crushed them as today so many women are destroyed by this experience. Honestly, I don't know where it came from. I've I've had this altruistic streak my entire life. I, I would imagine it came from my mom because she hated injustice. She did not like when people were being mistreated. She did not like that 
certain people in our country and in the world were treated as second-class citizens. Um, she did not like that women didn't have equal rights, and um, I, I guess it rubbed off on me, but also it rubbed off a lot on my older sister, and I followed my older sister's example a lot in a lot of things. I became an athlete. Um, I became philosophical. I became an, an activist at an early age, and I, I, I just, I don't know. I guess it came from there because I would see injustice on TV. I mean, the Vietnam War and Civil Rights Movement were on TV constantly, and I would see it happening outside, and then I, I could perfectly relate it to my house. We had no rights in my house. We were all females with this one white male who ruled everything, controlled everything. We had no say, and we just thought it was wrong, and we fought against it. I mostly fought against it, and I thought, I think I taught him a thing or two. I hope I did. And this is easy to ask, but I imagine it's the most difficult thing, or one of the more difficult things for your mom to do, would to leave him and then be alone again with the with the four kids. Did your mother ever talk about running away or getting out? That wasn't even an option. No, it's I write about it a lot. I'm I'm writing a memoir um, about a lot of this stuff and how I came through a lot of the fires I had to come through to get to where I am today. Um, so it's fine to talk about. Uh, I actually talk about it with teenagers because I want them to know that they they can come through it too if they're having a hard time at home. Um, but again, it was by then it was the early 70s, and I think my mom wanted to get divorced, but she had worries about where we would live, how we would eat, how we would earn a living, how we, you know, how all of that. Mostly, where would we live if we left him? And so it wasn't until my older sister came back from college and she got a job with the county and she, as a probation officer and she started meeting judges and lawyers. And so she encouraged my mom and said, I will help you. And also by the time they got divorced, I was 15. And so I was a strong voice too. And my, my, my middle sister was... 19, she was going to college, um, commuting to college and living home. And we all together got behind my mom and said, we need to leave this situation and we will help you. Let's do it. And we did. When I was a sophomore in high school, I was 15, and we got an apartment um, on the other side of town. I was in high school, so I didn't have to change schools or anything. And we we stayed in that apartment until just, until just about af, um, after I graduated high school. And it was the strength of her daughters. But the, the strength her daughters got, she didn't even realize that the strength that we had came from her. And so the tables turned, and she wasn't sure what to do. But we, by then, were strong. And we said, we need to go. And we did. It's paralyzing, this fear. And obviously, and I don't mean to demean any of this, but now, especially because we're going through what we're going through now in society and Me Too movement, we, in hindsight, it's always 2020, right? Then right. it must it, have been it devastating. Is, it is paralyzing. And then inertia takes over, and you kind of just feel like this is the new normal. And you just kind of coast along because of inertia, because if you if you don't do something to change your direction or your speed or whatever. You're just going to keep going and doing the same thing. And so the catalyst for my mom was us, her three daughters. And I really need to say something about my stepsister. Um, she, the first time that my mom wanted to get divorced, she wanted to come with us. She even wanted to leave her biological father and come with us. And then he apologized, and they reconciled. And so it wasn't until two years later 
she was a senior in high school at that point. It was May. She graduated, and the following September, she went off to college. And so she stayed with him, but she, even she, she only stayed with him so that she wouldn't have to move and then move again to go to college. But even she knew what a creep he was. And I would also like to say something about my oldest sister, Gloria, who learned so much from my mom. And once she started working for the county, she had to register as a Republican, even though she was most definitely not a Republican. In order to keep her job, she had to register as a Republican. And so she had access in 1972 to tickets because Richard Nixon was running for re-election at that point against George McGovern. And so she had access through the Republican Party and her job to tickets to a rally that he was giving at the Nassau Coliseum. And so she got, she and a friend at work got about 20 tickets and rounded up about 20 kids, teenagers, including myself and my stepsister. And they got us in, and we were supposed to be the part of the, the youth group that was attending this rally where Richard Nixon was going to speak. And so we were pushed up right up against the stage where he was he was coming out to, to speak at the uh, podium. And we were told what to do as soon as he came out. And as soon as he came out and started his speech, all of us started shouting, What about Watergate? What about Watergate? And we... <laughs> Stopped him cold. <laughs> we stopped his speech before he could even start it, and we just kept shouting and shouting and shouting this. And it took them a good five to seven minutes to get us out of there. And so my first real act of civil disobedience was when I was 14 years old and I got thrown out of the Nassau Coliseum for screaming at Richard Nixon. <laughs> All right. And my Gloria. mom didn't go. My mom didn't go. Yes, exactly. My mom didn't go because we could only get my sister could only get kids in, but she was very proud of us when we got home. Oh my gosh, that is absolutely brilliant. Go ahead. And so last last month, on the anniversary of the Parkland shooting, Gays Against Guns went down to Washington, and I volunteered to get arrested at the. Park Senate building, we um, we first did some actions going to visit some Senate offices to thank them. Of course, you, you don't see the senators, you see their aides, but we thanked a lot of senators for their good uh, choices um, when it came to voting on gun control and gun prevention, gun violence prevention. And then we went and chastised and kind of yelled at other senators for their lack of good choices and good votes. And then we went down to the floor of the Hart Senate building and we made a big heart that was broken. We used our bodies in a heart shape, eight of us, and made a big heart with silky red material and it was broken in half. In other words, our hearts are broken because of how gun violence in this country has just become this, this epidemic, this sickness. And uh, those of us who made the heart out of the red material were arrested. We were all volunteered to be arrested. You know, you pay your $50 fine and you, and you leave shortly afterwards. It's You get arrested for civil disobedience, which I have told my kids, that's the only thing you may ever get arrested for is civil disobedience because this is this is what it's come to. This is what we need to do. This is as an as a an act up activist in the late eighties and early nineties. We did die-ins. Uh, we did all kinds of marches and things. And now I am a member of Gays Against Guns and Rise and Resist. And we I, I go to at least three or four actions, protests, vigils, um, marches a week. Not a month, a week. I, I do three or four things a week because we cannot let fascism take over this country and the rest of the world. Are your children, do they have the same passion? My kids understand, and they do have a passion for it. My oldest 
is 20 and she she has a career she doesn't she doesn't have a whole lot of time to do things but she has a lot of followers on Twitter and they are all young people all around the country and the world and she tweets appropriate things constantly and she when she is on tour in concert she says appropriate things to try to change people's minds um, and get people to do the right thing and she has come to a couple of protests with me um, when she's she lives in, in California right now but um, when she's here and I'm going to a protest she comes with me and my twins are 16 they're kind of there's a, it's almost like a generational line between my 20 year old and my 16 year olds they are just so appalled and shocked by what's going on in the world that they have almost, they and all their friends have almost closed up. They feel like there's no hope. They never want to have children. I have reminded them that they need to go to college because that's what middle girls do. Um, but they, they don't see the point because the world is just so messed up at, at this point. Um, but they have come with me to certain things. They came with me last year to the Women's March. They came with me two years ago to the Women's March in D.C. Um, Case Against Guns has what we call human beings who dress all in white and put veils in front of their faces and hold placards with picture and information about someone who has been taken away by gun violence, killed by gun violence, and um, a human being represents that person and stands in for them and is silent the whole time and just takes the place of that person on that placard who they are representing who was killed. And uh, they have both come to marches and things and acted as human beings. And, in fact, they at the Women's March in New York City in 2018, they brought a bunch of their high school friends. And so we had all these teenagers representing kids who were killed in Parkland and Sandy Hook. And they understand the importance, but I think they feel, talk about being paralyzed, they, 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 talk, they feel paralyzed. They feel like there is no hope. Even overwhelmed. though they see me... Yeah, they're overwhelmed. overwhelmed. Even though they see me doing the work I do, I, I, I sometimes wonder if they think the work I do is all for nothing because like this fascism is taking over and how how can we ever change the direction that this country and this world are are going in well they want to be kids too then have fun and like we used to just be out they want to just not have all of this doom and gloom right they 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 want to have their childhood their teenagerhood um but they do get it I'm sure it. they do. <laughs> With a mom like you, <laughs> I know they get yeah. it. <laughs> and you yeah. know what? They may not be as active, uh, you know, right now, but you know what? You've planted that seed, like your mom, and the cards are on the table at a very early age, and your sister Gloria. You know, that's the neat thing about it. And as they get older, they'll figure out how they want to express themselves. Right. I hope so. I think maybe once they go off to college and meet, I mean, the students right now are amazing, the Parkland kids and, you know, the high school kids who walked out of school last week, the, the, the kids in college now, that a lot of them are so amazing. And I think that once my twins get to college, they, they might become more active. The twins you adopted, and they're from Vietnam? My twins, yes, were born in Ho Chi Minh City. And have they been back? Not yet. Not yet. We all will go back, me and B and the twins. We will go back as a family at some point in the near future. And your older daughter, B. Miller, is a performer, a singer, songwriter, and she was yes. seen on X Factor a couple of years ago, and she, you know, there she was, Maplewood Middle School student, <laughs> just like all the yeah, other ones. Right. She, she made it right. to the big stage, man. <laughs> B. Miller, make sure you check out her music. All right, she's doing really well. She just released um, another single called It's Not You, It's Me, and it's, I think it's a great song, and it will be on her third album, which will come out in the spring, 
sometime. She's she's going on tour. She's actually headlining her own tour in April and May. I'm Jackie Tantillo, and my guest is Kim Miller. You're listening to Should Have Listened to My Mother. I want to tell everybody a little bit about what you do professionally as your second job, (laughs) in addition to the activism. You're a stage manager. You're a television stage manager, and you've worked with some of the biggest celebrities, the hottest talent around. You've also worked at a number of the Olympics for NBC TV. Right. Um, I have been a TV stage manager for 36 years. I'm getting ready to retire soon. No, really? Uh, yeah, I'm very Why? excited about that. <laughs> what are you going to do? Oh, I don't know. Activism. I, I don't know. Maybe, you know, send my kids off to college and follow my top dreams. singer daughter around the world. I, I don't know. There's lots of things I could do. I am writing, but yes, I, I have been a TV stage manager for more than 30 years. Um, I've done five Olympics for CBS and NBC. I have met just about everybody that you could think of. And uh, I, had, I had quite a, an amazing career. Um, my favorite story is when I met Barack Obama, Senator Barack Obama in 2004, the morning of the night that he was due to give the keynote speech in Boston at the Democratic Convention, and he was due to be on our show in about two minutes, and we couldn't find him, and finally we saw him all the way across the, um, it was called the Fleet Center back then, we saw him all the way across the, the Fleet Center on the other side, and he was just taking off his microphone after being interviewed by Fox. And to this day, we all think that they were keeping him late to try to mess with our schedule. But anyway, the producer said, there he is. And I gave the producer my headset because it was a hard wire. I couldn't walk around with it. I said, hold this. And I took off and I ran up the whole length of the fleet center, walked up to him and said, Senator Obama, my name is Kim. I'm from CBS and you're due to be on our show in less than two minutes. And he went to shake my hand, and instead of letting my hand go, he he kept shaking it, and he said, where? And I pointed all the way across to the other end, and I said, all the way over there. And so he squeezed my hand tighter and said, let's run, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> so I ran with Barack Obama's hand in mine all the way back to where CBS was set up, and just in the nick of time, I brought him in, the A2 put his microphone on, I introduced him to Hannah Storm, who was our talent that day, and I put my headset on, and I heard the AD saying, stand by, 15 seconds, and then I counted down from 10, and boom, he was on. Oh, how fun is that? Oh, that's yeah. such a magical little story. Thank you so right. much. So, I've had all kinds of experiences like that with celebrities. Just for people who don't know what a stage manager is or does or responsibilities and duties, just fill us in. Um, Yeah, so in a studio situation or like that on a remote situation, you're basically the boss of the crew. um, And you keep the timing right. You you tell the the talent how much time back from commercial or how much time out of um, a, a tape package. Um, and you chew them, and you tell the the lighting guys, let's move over here. You tell the cameraman, let's, you know, we have, we're going over here now. We're, then next, we're going over there. Strike this chair. Bring two more chairs in. Just everything. You, you're just in charge of everything that goes on. And you are basically the first and last person to deal with the talent, whether they're an actor or singer or politician, anybody that comes into the studio. So even when, if you're recording something, you have the intimate downtime with this person. You usually keep make sure they're comfortable. You get them anything that they need. So you're chit-chatting and you're hanging out. And you have such a great personality. You could talk to, to anybody and be so, so endearing, which is really fun. But it's a crucial job. And if you're not good at that job, nothing else happens. Well, I've managed to last 36 years, so I guess I'm pretty good at it. I, you know, <laughs> I've yes, worked for the networks, are. and my first Olympics was um, Nagano in 1998 with CBS. And then 
uh, CBS's coverage of the Olympics ended. And so I had to try to get into the NBC Olympic coverage. And it took me a while. So uh, I was working on, I was filling in at Conan O'Brien. And my friend there asked me if I wanted to go to Torino in 2006. And I said, of course I want to go to Torino. I've been trying to get into the NBC Olympic crew for a while. And he said the stage manager, the other stage manager that they had, because he did, he did prime time and they needed somebody for the, uh, the daytime show with Jim Lampley. Um, and so I, I said, well, when you tell them about me, don't, don't, don't forget to tell them that I speak Italian. So, um, and you know, I have, I obviously have Olympic experience with CBS. And so they hired me and I went to, uh, Torino in 2006, Beijing in 2008, um, Vancouver in 2010, and London in 2012. And then yeah, there's cutbacks, so I, I was not included on the crew that went to Sochi, which it was a perfect time for me to stop because, you know, they, they, they kill people. They kill gay people in Russia, so I was fine not going to Sochi. You definitely don't want that. Right. I, when I was in college, I worked at the 1980 Olympics in Lake Placid, of all places, Lake Placid, New York. And I was stationed at the Olympic Village, which was a prison, and they got rid of all the inmates, and that's where the athletes were housed. And, and I was assigned a country. I was assigned, and I had a van, and I did the, the night shift, so I was responsible for Lebanon, and there I think there were three athletes. They all lived in California. <laughs> Not that the Lebanese aren't known for being great skiers and winter sport people, but they were really nice, and they had a blast. So we would drive around. I got to go all my friends from SUNY Plattsburgh. They worked in, and managed all the events, so I basically got a carte blanche into anything I wanted to go to. It was really fun. Talk about a different perspective of the Olympics. 1980 Olympics and tiny little Lake Placid. It was just one of the most amazing experiences. And I have to say, I'm, I'm not thrilled with the politics of the Olympics and what goes on behind the scenes. But when you're there and you're in that international community, it is pretty special. You walk down the street in the host city and you just at every turn, you hear a different language, and it's amazing. And all these people are getting along and um, coming together to do this giant thing. And um, it's it really is a special experience. It really is. And the fact that they've been able to pull this thing off for so many years, the networks and the, the cities and towns that completely transform themselves. It takes a lot of dedicated people and a lot of hours. You get seven years if you're the host city. Seven years to to transform. Get ready. Yeah. That's amazing what they do in seven years. So you are a dedicated worker, you're a dedicated activist, you're a mom and you're really fun to be with. It'll be twenty one years since she passed away. Twenty one years since Anne passed away. And there's probably not a day goes by that you don't think of her. No, absolutely. I miss her so much. I, I, I constantly want to call her and ask her things. And still, twenty, almost 21 years later, I, I would so, so, so love to talk to my mom. And I miss her so very much. And it's weird because as much as I miss my mom, I, I, I guess I miss my dad. I mean, of course I miss my dad, but I, I never got to know him. So I don't really know what I'm missing. I don't know how to miss him. I just, it makes, just makes me sad that I never got to know him. Everybody loved your dad so much. Every, everybody loved my dad. Yes, that's true. If you were to talk to your mom, what would you say to her? Oh, um, she never met my children. She had a relationship with my middle sister's son and daughter, who are now in their 30s. Um, if I could just have five minutes with her, I would... First of all, hug her for a very long time, but then I would, of course, introduce her to the three grandchildren that she never knew she had. Um, she would be so thrilled that I had kids because I was such a tomboy, and I would say, "I'm, you know, I'm not getting married. I'm not having children." Well, okay, one of those things was true. I never married a man, 
Um, but I did have a female partner, and we I had I gave birth to B. I'm single now, by the way. Um, <laughs> but I throw that in there. <laughs> Just putting that out there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, she would just absolutely be amazed that I am the mom of three wonderful daughters. Well, I think, and this is my belief, she is so much in your heart and she is present. And I believe that she sees, knows, and feels everything. So I, I trust and believe that she totally is locked into those girls. Huge part of her is in them through you. Right. I, I see her in them, and they obviously got that through me, but I, I see her in them often. Was it an issue at all when you just had to come out, when you decided to come out with your family? I Yes, I, I finally had a girlfriend. You know, because of my quote-unquote stepfather, emotions were very hard for me. I had to relearn them. And so I kind of thought I would never have anybody in my life. But then in the early 80s, I came out. It was after college, and I finally found somebody. I had a girlfriend, and so, of course, I needed to tell my mom, and so I took her to lunch in the city. By then, I was living in Brooklyn, and she came into the city, and we went to lunch, and I, I told her I finally met someone, and I said, um, you know, I, I don't have a boyfriend, Mom. I have a girlfriend, and she was like, fine. She was like, okay. When do I get to meet her? Oh, oh, gosh, Kim, after all that you went through and all that so many people suffer for years when they hide, and then to have someone as loving as your mom and mm -hmm. just be so open and accepting. Right. If it could be that wonderful for many people, right? right? And I, I did feel like damaged from my nine years with her ex-husband, but I've been working on that my entire life, in therapy, in my writing, in my reading and philosophies. Uh, I have just been working on being the best person that I can be and, and being comfortable with myself. And that's one of the things that people tell me all the time, is that I seem just so incredibly comfortable with who I am. And I owe a lot of that to my mom for making it okay for me to be a tomboy, for me to be a lesbian, for me to be an activist. I owe her a lot. I owe her everything. Have you forgiven your mom's ex? Yes, that's part of the healing process is to just understand that I mean, he was a monster, but he was a monster because he was raised by monsters. And so... Uh, you know, I, I cannot dwell on his negativity and his horrible attitude towards life and other people. I have forgiven him and moved on. Good for you. That's huge. I think that's, a, a like you said, a huge part of the healing process. And he probably was living in inner turmoil as well. But that's his, he's got to figure that out. You played sports. You were a softball player. Yes, I'm a softball player. I'm a 60-year-old softball player. I started playing softball on a rec league when I was nine, and I have played some kind of organized softball almost almost every year since then. I uh, was a member of my junior high school team, my high school team. I played just like a rec team in college, and then I moved to Brooklyn and joined the Prospect Park Women's Softball League, which is an amazing phenomenon. We, it's a, an instructional league, and those of us who are really good softball players teach. They try to make this, the same amount of beginners, intermediate, and advanced players on every team. And if you're an advanced player, it's your, your responsibility to teach the beginners and the intermediate players to be better players. And I was in that league for more than 20 years. This will be my third season playing again on my old team in Brooklyn. What position do you play? Um, I am a natural second baseman, but I'm getting old and, and, you know, not as able to move around as I used to, so I play a lot of first base now. 
and I believe uh, that your mom came to one of your softball games in this my, in the city. Yes, my mom. When I lived in Brooklyn, and my mom lives so on Long Island, she would drive in and sleep over on nights that I had softball games. She she had been coming to my softball games since junior high school. She would come and watch me play softball in junior high and high school and all the bar leagues that I played in. And then um, she she came to my games on Long Island. She I mean on in Brooklyn. She'd bring a chair and she'd sit there. All my teammates knew her. And one time we we went to the field and um, the other team didn't show up. So there were these guys playing on the field and we had the permit starting at six every night. And so we told them, you need to get off the field because we have the permit and we have a game. And they looked around, they said, well, we don't see the other team, so you can't play, so we're staying. And so we had this big argument with them because even if the other team didn't show up, we it was our field. And we were planning to just practice and have like a little scrimmage within our own team. And they just figured, well, there's no other team here, so you can't play a game. So we're staying. And they kept playing, and we started yelling at them and trying to force them off the field through the outfield. And I went to help my team try to get rid of these guys. And I told my mom, you stay in the dugout. I'll be right back. And so we like kind of lined up and started just walking towards them and pushing these guys off the field, out past second base and through the outfield. And they finally gave up. It was a big shouting match, but they finally, you know, they they probably called us um, derogatory lesbian names and um, gave us the finger and whatever else. But we managed to walk them halfway out of the outfield, and they just finally said, fine, we're, we're out of here, and they kept going. And so we turned around to go back to the dugout, And I turn around, and my mother is standing five feet behind me with a softball bat in her hand. (laughs) I I just looked at her. I was like, Mom, what are you doing? And she said, well, if you were going to get into a fight, I was going to be right behind you. (laughs) It's like, oh, my God, Mom, come on. Thank you. And all my teammates were amazed. But I was like, oh, my God, Mom, come on. Let's go back to your chair. Go sit with the dog. I used to bring my dog to all my softball games. And I go go back and sit with Jetson, and and we'll we'll just you know I'm sorry there's not going to be a game, but we'll we're going to practice, and you, and then we'll go and get some dinner. <laughs> and I just I I will never ever as long as I live forget to look on my mom's face like she was determined. And those guys fucked us. All gave us that Italian she, blood. Yep. Kim Miller, I can't thank you enough. I can't thank you enough for sharing all of this wealth of information and passion and love. Your mom is remarkable. She's truly remarkable. Thank you for having me. It's it's been great to talk about it. Lots more to talk about next week on Should Have Listened to My Mother. Subscribe or share on social media. I'm Jackie Tantillo. See you next week.